Um, so we're going to start sort of out of this proper today. I mean, we we spent the beginning of this week trying to motivate it, trying to explain how calculus works and what it's good for. But today we'll sort of start doing what might be properly called calculus problems. <laughs> um, it's slightly, well, the way calculus, modern calculus classes are structured is always a little awkward. We're going to spend maybe just a little longer on limits than, um, than seems advisable, but it's, um, I mean, it's all standard material. We can't cut it out. And, um, and and limits are, again, the way calculus is sort of done nowadays. Limits are foundational. It makes sense to talk about them first. It's just that it means there are going to be a few weeks before we start talking about rates of change and really look at, you know, what calculus is good for. And we introduce the, the idea of a limit at the end of class on um, on Tuesday. We try to motivate it using a rising and falling object. And we wound up with this notation. And this notation is asking us as X gets closer and closer to C. But does not equal C. What happens to F of X? Or trying to maybe frame that a little more formally. What does f of x approach? And again, I said this, of course, on Tuesday. But I want to emphasize that in almost all real world situations where we care about a limit, the function isn't even going to be defined at c. That was what happened in class yesterday. We wanted to look at what happened as x approached 1, and um, the function was not defined at 1 itself. It gave us a division by 0 error. So today, we're going to sort of I'll well, make some comments about limits. We're going to talk about finding limits in some situations. So making a few comments, um, the limit as X approaches C of F of X might not even exist. And there are a few reasons that a, um, stand in front of the window, sorry, I'm really uh, vulnerable to heat. Um, there are a few reasons that a limit might fail to exist. 
In fact, there are kind of three standard reasons. And two of them are important enough that they get their own entire section of the textbook dedicated to them. And then one of them is more of a toy. It's, it's you can create a function that doesn't have a limit, but it's not something you see a lot in the real world. And going through reasons limits might not exist, will also help us nail down what limits are and what they do. So let's look at a piecewise defined function selected more or less at random. f of x is x minus one when x is less than four and it's x plus three when x is greater than four. And my claim is that the limit as x approaches four does not exist. DNE is a standard abbreviation. And because we don't really know how to find limits yet, it might be um, sort of not immediately obvious how to show that a limit doesn't exist. One, way we might approach this problem is by looking at the graph. So let me get, uh, our calculator is, is no good to us here. Our calculator doesn't want to graph piecewise defined functions. <laughs> go to Desmos. I know that if you're looking at the recording, you're not currently seeing anything. Let me jot this down on my physical whiteboard. And now let's go to Desmos. And Desmos doesn't really want to graph piecewise defined functions either, but what Desmos does do very easily is that if you want to put restrictions on your value x, you can use curly brackets to do so. So, I don't know if it's possible to graph sort of in one swoop a piecewise defined function, but I can certainly do this. And because this is the same function, let's use the same color. And I say there's a problem. I say the limit doesn't exist at x equals four. Well, because let's ask ourselves, what happens as x approaches four? Let's select this graph and let's sort of scroll along and let's see what y is doing as x gets closer to four. Negative 6.6, .6, negative 2.06, 1.7, As X is getting closer and closer to four, Y is getting closer and closer to three. At least that's what we just saw. And if that 
were true, the limit would be three. As X is getting closer and closer to four, Y is getting closer and closer to three. But you may already, already have figured out the, the issue here. When I was getting closer and closer to four, I was doing it from this direction. And Y was getting closer and closer to three. Let's go up here and let's get closer and closer to four and let's see what happens. Well, Y is 21.6. Let's go way down here 11.16, 8.6, 7.6. Seven point nine, seven point seventeen, seven point zero six, seven. As X is getting closer and closer to four here, Y is getting closer and closer not to three. to seven. So the question, as X gets closer and closer to four, but does not equal four, what value does this function approach? This is a question without an answer, or rather, at least it's a question without a single answer. The answer is, well, maybe three, maybe seven. It depends on how you do it. And you cannot have a limit of three or seven. Limits are numbers. So... Way one, a limit might not exist. If it depends, what direction? you approach C from. And, and remember, C here is, is the number that, that X is approaching. Um, Again, sort of speaking of standard things, when you're writing down or when you're introducing limits, it's we use C always. X approaches C. So, as I say, I said that two of these things are sort of important enough that they'll get their own textbook section kind of dedicated to them. I don't remember the numbering offhand, but the section titled One-Sided Limits will come back to this. Way two, a limit might not exist. Way two, let's try that again. Way two, a limit. Ooh. Zoom is regressing. <laughs> it's just been working so well, and now this whiteboard is just throwing a tantrum. Let me try that again. Way to a limit might not exist. Let's try the following. F of X 
is just to make it very clear what's going on, let's say f of x is one divided by x squared. And let's take the limit as x approaches zero of f of x. Here's a limit that doesn't exist. And we're going to want to be very careful about um, when we sort of try to figure out why this limit doesn't exist. Because sort of the first thing that might pop into your head is, oh, well, it's not defined at zero. One divided by zero squared is a division by zero error. So that's why this limit doesn't exist. But again, this underlined statement, which is now a circled statement, means that that cannot be the problem. If we want to know what happens as x approaches zero, we're not letting x equal zero ever. So the fact that we get a division by zero error has nothing to do with anything. So the problem here is not that we get a division by zero error here. In fact, this is exactly the situation we were in yesterday when we got a division by zero error, but that limit existed. It was 20.3 or something. I mean, the problem is simply, and here we could we could go to our calculator to see what the problem is, or we could do it graphically. Is my calculator loaded up? Ugh, I forgot that they changed this. You. Okay, our calculator wants me to sign in, so I'm going to go to Desmos, which is not making itself a pain in, in the rear. And I'll take a look at one divided by x squared. And the question on the board is, as x approaches zero, what number does y approach? And well, let's look at y. 0. 0.4, 2 0.5, 9. something, 17, 46.78, 127.7. It doesn't really look like y is approaching some number, does it? It looks as if as x approaches zero, y is just getting bigger and bigger. And that is exactly what is happening. Yes as x approaches c, f of x does not approach a number, but instead blows up, like we just saw on Desmos, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not exist. And again, what I said earlier, um, this, this method of non-existence is very important and will get its own textbook section or half a textbook section, let's say, dedicated to it later on. So I'm not dwelling on these things just because I know we'll be coming back to them.
The third sort of standard way a limit might not exist um, does not get a textbook section dedicated to it. It's sort of a, a made up problem most of the time, but I'll say infinite oscillation. And then, because that's probably not clear at all, I'll dive right in and we'll look at an example. The limit as x approaches zero of the sine of one over x. And again, I should emphasize that the problem here is not that we get a division by zero error if we plug zero in. We've said this a few times now, but I don't feel bad. Sometimes, you know, you repeat important things, but we've said it a few times now that when you're looking at a limit, you don't care what happens at this value, you care what happens near the value. So the fact that we'd get a division by zero error, whatever, that doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that this function looks crazy near zero. And that craziness, an extremely technical term, is going to stop the limit from existing. So here's the limit. Here's the sign of 1 over x. Let's look at what happens near 0. So let's let x go from maybe negative 0.5 to, let me mess with y2 negative two to positive two from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. Here's this graph, the best that Desmos is able to generate it. And I mean, what happens to y as x gets close to zero? It's at 0.18, it's at negative 0.9, it's at 0 0.05, it's at 0 0.09, it's at positive 0.5, it's at positive 0.4, it's at negative 0.2. The answer to the question, what happens as x approaches zero, is just that this curve bounces around in a wild way. And I mean that what's happening here is as x approaches zero, this is going to infinity. And the sine of x oscillates between a negative one and one an infinite number of times as x goes to infinity. So here, you know, on this interval from negative 0.1 to positive 0.1, we're oscillating between a negative um, one and positive one an infinite number of times, an infinite number of waves in a finite space. And again, what happened, the fact that this is, the, that's the problem. That's, um, in fact, let's go ahead and let's not share what I was trying to share there. Let's define a new function. A piecewise defined function that is the sine of one over x when x is not equal to zero, but is three. 
when x does equal zero. Just to try to drive home the fact that it's not the division by zero error that's causing us problems. This function no longer gives us a division by zero error. This function is defined everywhere. But, I mean, as far as the limit goes, let's see, I'm not sure how to do not equal on Desmos, but I can hack this. So this function is now defined everywhere. It's never giving you a division by zero error, but that doesn't fix the limit. We're still oscillating infinitely and I mean, you can you can see, I mean, th this function in a sense is not super complicated. One over X isn't super complicated. The sign is, now well, the sign's kind of complicated, but I mean, we, di we didn't have to define any new functions or do anything crazy to make this happen. Still, it's, it's not something we're going to run into again in this class. And it's the only sort of way a limit can fail to exist that's not going to have a textbook section given over to it. So there's non-existence. I guess you can say that, I mean, I'm following the textbook here, but I guess you can say that's a kind of weird order to do things in. First, we talk about when these limits don't exist, then we talk about when they do exist. But, is going to be finding limits and sort of returning to my suggestion that the way text, and, and to be clear, there are like three standard calculus textbooks and they all present the material in exactly the same way. This is, and you know, I don't want to vary from this because if I have like online students who are taking this at, um, at another college, they need to cover the material their professor assumes they will cover. So if, if you're listening to me kvetch a little and thinking, well, if you don't like it, just fix it. It's not quite as easy as that. Anyway, I was saying that, that I, you know, the way textbooks present binding limits is a little deceptive, I think, because we can find limits. That's perfectly okay. But there's, there's sort of a problem that the textbooks don't tend to be very explicit about, and that's that the limits that are easy to find using the rules presented in and maybe I'll stop throwing the textbook under the bus and just say calculus one. The limits that are easy to find using the rules presented in calculus one are precisely 
most of the time or a lot of the time, the limits we pair the least about. The interesting limits or the limits that that have real world meaning tend to be the ones where the rules don't work. And I mean, that's unfortunate, but there's nothing we can do about it. It's just a, how should I put this? It's just a facet of calculus. It's a fact of life, maybe I should say. There's nothing really to be done about it. And we will learn a few tricks for finding trickier limits. But um, for now, let me just present to you some limit rules. And especially the first two limit rules, once you see them written on the whiteboard, are probably going to be really, like you're probably going to say, yes, that, that makes perfect sense. The limit as X approaches C of a constant equals the constant. Shared the wrong thing again. Let's get back to Desmos and let's, uh, let's look at the function f of x equals five. And let's ask what happens as f of x approaches some number, as f of x approaches a three. The limit as x approaches three of five. Okay, so where is three? It's over here. Let's see what happens to y as x approaches three. Okay, y is five, still five, 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 five. It certainly looks as if as x approaches three, y is sticking to five. So hence, this rule. The limit as x approaches c of x equals c. Again, if this, I mean, this might not be obvious just because we're seeing this material, a lot of you, for the first time. But once we think about it, I mean, X and Y are the same thing here. The input and the output are the same. So what happens to Y as X approaches C? Well, y also approaches c because they're the same thing. Or again, if you don't find that convincing, we could go to Desmos and we could look at a concrete example. We could look at the limit as x approaches three. Here's f of x equals x. It looks a little weird because of the zoom. There we go. So where's three? Three is here. 
Let me make that dotted. And let's ask what happens as X approaches three. Well, Y is one, 2015, 2.58, 2.7, 2.86, 2.94, 2.96. As X approaches three, Y is also approaching three. And, and this is also happening if we approach three from the other direction. Remember that we said order shouldn't matter or direction shouldn't matter rather. 7.4576.4257 So this is a humble beginning. But we're going to take those rules and then we're going to learn some rules for like multiplication, powers, division, and so on. And by the end of that, we'll be able to find the limits of polynomials and the limits of rational functions and the limits of some quite messy looking functions. So, I might not be going in exactly the same order as the textbook. I mean, the textbook has these rules as just a big list. I'm covering the same rules, but maybe not in quite the same order. This, uh, this third rule is technically redundant. Um, in the sense that we're going to learn another multiplication rule that is more powerful than it. But it's worth probably thinking of as its own thing because it shows up so often. The limit as X approaches C of a constant times a function <laughs> is the constant times the limit of the function. So at the moment, we only know how to take the limit of a very small pool of functions, but we can still show an example. The limit as X approaches four, let's say, of seven times X. So we've got the seven, the seven is a constant. And we've got the x, the x is a function. And according to this rule, we can, the normal way this is phrased is that we can pull the constant out in front of the limit. We can rewrite it as the constant times the limit of the function. So our answer is what? 28 is exactly correct. Because this limit, we learned how to find in the previous frame. We said that the limit as x approaches a number of x is the number. So this is seven times four equals 28. 
And um, this rule is um, in this rule, you see, we have a constant times a function. And pretty soon we'll learn a rule for if we have two functions multiplied by one another. But we should probably be trying to present these rules in sort of order of difficulty. And probably most people find addition easier than multiplication. So let's state as our next rule that the limit, well, let's state the rule for addition and subtraction together. You've seen it in the quadratic form, Deva, but does everybody remember plus or minus? So the rule for addition is the same as the rule for subtraction. So I'm stating them at the same time. And that rule is that if you're adding or subtracting, you just take the individual limit and we add and subtract them. So for example, what's the limit as X approaches three of four plus X? Could you, I think I heard it. Could whoever <laughs> spoke speak louder? Seven. Seven is correct. It's the limit as X approaches three of four plus the limit as X approaches three of X. And now each of these limits we can take. The limit of a constant is the constant the limit of x is the number x approaches four plus three equals seven. What about the limit as x approaches five of one minus two x? Well, what's the limit as X approaches four of one? This is going for one. What's the limit as X approaches four of two times X? Do eight. eight is correct. Remember that if you have a constant like two, You can pull it out in front of the limit. So one minus eight is negative seven. And by the way, I, I know I, even though I know I shouldn't because it's bad pedagogy, I do sometimes use the word easy, and I'm never trying to make anyone feel bad. Well, I, easy isn't easy when you're learning this material for the first time. 
What I mean is straightforward in the sense that you don't have to use any weird special tricks. You can just hit these directly with the rules and get them that way. And with two minutes left, we'll pick up tomorrow exactly where we're leaving off today with multiplication. I will see you then.